Unmanned Aircraft Systems, UAS, are one of the fastest growing segments in the national airspace system. Our next panel, Integrating Remotely Piloted Aircraft into the NAS, will give us more insight on this. Please welcome NACA's National UAS Representative, Steve Widener. Good morning. So you heard Paul yesterday talk a significant amount in his opening remarks about unmanned aircraft systems and the panel that just preceded us on emerging technologies includes UAS. So I want to give you a little bit of scope on what we're talking about here when it comes to unmanned aircraft currently in the national airspace system and what we're looking at in the future. Today there's approximately 325,000 manned aircraft registered uh, in the United States. Compare that to over 1.2 million drones registered today in the United States. Projections in just less than two years uh, put that number at over 7 million. Um, by 2025, we're talking about a $90 billion industry. So hopefully what you're, what you're taking away from this is that these aren't going away. And as UAS start to play a greater and greater role in your everyday lives, that means they're going to start to play a greater and greater role in your work life as well. So over the next hour, uh, you're going to hear from uh, some of the foremost experts uh, in industry and at the FAA on integrating unmanned aircraft into the national airspace system. Uh, before I bring out the panel, I'd like to introduce my co-moderator and uh, my co-NACA lead on unmanned aircraft integration from NACA, Jeff Richards out of Chicago Center. So those of you who know Jeff, jeffs uh, he's one of the smartest guys I've ever met. Uh, but in addition to that, I, I know, that wasn't supposed to be the, the funny line. But in addition to that, Jeff's also one of the funniest guys you'll ever meet. So if you get a chance to spend any time with Jeff, take it. You, you definitely won't regret that. Um, all right, now let's bring up our panel. First, uh, from Syracuse Tower, air traffic controller and staff support specialist, Sandra Gregoire. Lieutenant Colonel Aaron Brown, call signs Copper. He is the Director of Operations for the 108th Attack Squadron of the New York Air National Guard. <laughs> Dr. Paramal Kopadecker, and that's a mouthful, so we just call him PK. He is the Senior Technologist for Air Transportation Systems at NASA. One of Jeff and I's uh, closest counterparts at the FAA, the ATO UAS Integration Manager, Randy Willis. <laughs> Dallas Brooks, who is the director, I'm sorry, Sean Cassidy. Sean Cassidy, who is the Director of Safety and Regulatory Affairs at Amazon Prime Air. And now, Dallas Brooks, the director of the Raspit Flight <laughs> Research Laboratory at Mississippi State University. Yeah. I got a lot better looking there for a minute. <laughs> so, Randy, I'm going to start with a question uh, from you, but before I do, um, just give you a little background on Randy. Uh, this is a, a pretty smart panel here, and there's some pretty smart people in this room, but I'll arguably say that Randy has forgotten more about UAS than most of us uh, in this room will ever know. Um, he gave his first clearance to an unmanned aircraft in 1996 as a controller in the United States Navy, and so he brings over two decades of unmanned experience and integration to the stage here. So, Randy, from that standpoint, uh, as a, you know, from the FAA as a safety regulator, what can we expect to see over the next uh, year or two concerning integration of UAS? All right, thanks, Steve, and uh, thanks for uh, inviting me in. This is my uh, second time to be here, so it's really a good environment to be in to talk about a uh, growing and uh, industry, uh, and, and growing is probably a bad word for it. Uh, it's uh, certainly it's uh, certainly more than that. Uh, but I wanted to talk about some of the things that were taking place and really focus on the regulatory side of the House uh, and the issues that we're addressing within FAA today. 
So there's a single chart that we put up to help kind of frame the discussion. Uh, the area on the left, you see, that's how we're doing business today, how we're putting aircraft in the air, how we're letting them to perform and do their jobs and functions. There's a many, many ways to do that. Uh, we've been issuing certificates of authorization for almost two decades from the agency uh, to do various things, uh, initially with public aircraft operators, the DOD, uh, Department of Homeland Security, et cetera. Uh, but that's actually uh, greatly expanded over the last five to six years uh, to include individual companies, uh, startups, um, individuals, you name it, uh, the new Part 107 rule, a little more than uh, two years old now, has seen significant growth in the uh, operations today. You mentioned the number of registrations that are in place. Uh, that's indicative of the operations that are taking place out there. There are uh, many, many thousands of operations that are taking place uh, today, every single day in our airspace. Um, all those operations are informing um, or what we would call enabling our rulemaking efforts that we have. A lot of the Part 107 pieces that require waivers in order to uh, gain airspace access and uh, do the functions that they want to do. And we're learning from them as they go through the process and they provide feedback to us to incorporate that and move that into our rulemaking activities. Uh, this is not all-inclusive list of things and how we're going to move forward, nor is it probably the right uh, order in which we'll be moving forward. So there, uh, the work going on in uh, remote identification uh, to enable uh, operations beyond visual line of sight, uh, operations over people, uh, and then move on uh, further down the line to uh, doing segregated operations, uh, no longer making them segregated, but making them integrated operations into our normal system that we have today. And typically in those discussions, we find ourselves in the larger airframe uh, discussion uh, for UAS uh, to work in that area. And then ultimately some package delivery. And, uh, and as uh, touched on in the last panel briefly, the urban air mobility, uh, eventually uh, we could be uh, carrying people around and uh, moving them that way. So obviously all them would need rules and regulations to uh, fly and operate under. And uh, we've identified them and uh, have them in there and we are gaining, um, I'd say the baseline knowledge to help uh, understand and then move them forward. Randy, as a follow-up, um, remote ID is, is extremely important to UAS integration. Can you give us a little background and a little information on why that is, that is so integral? Yeah, I'll just talk real high level about it. So it's, uh, it's very important uh, from our uh, security partners, federal securities partners, they express interest and in ability to have to have an uh, opportunity to uh, identify uh, an aircraft operating in our NAS today. Uh, currently that does not exist and uh, the remote ID piece is uh, the discussion to enable that, to uh, actually put uh, potentially something on an aircraft uh, to identify them uh, in a certain way to uh, certain folks. Okay, thanks. PK, over here. Yeah. Th uh, if James Brown is the godfather of Seoul, you, sir, are the godfather of UTM. <laughs> <laughs> Get back. And I think everybody up here agrees. Yeah. <laughs> so the um, question, I guess, would be what is UTM and why is it needed and how is it going to help um, controllers, basically, or the, uh, the NAS in general? So, Jeff, thank you for the question. I will make two comments before I get into the UTM. First of all, I really appreciate the collaboration we have with Jeff and Steve and the NATCA are all working with NASA on the UTMs. And second is... I started working, studying air traffic controllers workload about 25 years ago when I was doing PhD. I did a lot of field studies at Cleveland Center, LA, Anchorage, New York, many, many locations. Ravina was my favorite sector. Anybody here who operates Ravina sector, <laughs> sector 25. So, uh, so we did a lot of field studies and that time we realized that air traffic controllers workload is an interesting and complex problem you can't overload air traffic controllers without additional either decision support tools or different way of managing vehicles. So what ended up happening is fast forward 20 years from then and then as soon as the small UAS started to emerge, we realized that we can't use the same model for below 400 feet, particularly starting off with uncontrolled environment. So we created an environment where 
air traffic control systems has complete awareness of what's happening in the airspace and they can issue directives and constraints but not focus on giving clearances to this large number of vehicles. So it's a share and care environment. UTM essentially is a share and care environment where every operator connects in through digital exchanges and share the intent with each other and stay away from each other right from the planning stage. FIA and the controllers have awareness as needed on demand and they can issue any directives or constraints, particularly to clear their space or um, certainly <clears throat> change the flows of the, in the airspace based on the security and safety issues. But primarily, it allows operators to exchange information about their areas of operations or trajectories with each other through prescribed, predefined data exchange protocols and we divided up roles responsibilities such as there is a role for FAA and air traffic control system, US operator and third party entities who can provide the data and services such as flight planning, weather data, some surveillance and communication among each other. How close do you think we are? December? How close we are? <laughs> How close are we to an actual ATM? Oh, UTM's? that's a great question. So uh, UTM is, uh, we divided up in four uh, technical capability levels. First one was just studying the data exchange protocols and how operators will interact with each other under the regulatory authority of FAA. Second is to go beyond visual line of sight. So the technologies and the procedures needed to go beyond visual line of sight um, are different uh, in the sense that you need to be able to track yourself so you know where you said you are going to be and if there are any contingencies, you need to be able to inform the others and they can stay away from you. It's like defensive driving. So then the third one is presence of manned and unmanned. We just finished the field testing of that. And fourth one is uh, focused on urban airspace, which has its own interesting complexities that we are going to study in terms of GPS degradation and such. But FIA and us have been working very closely along with a lot of um, operators and uh, industry members. So this is a really good example of collaborative innovation. Uh, and the things that we studied and we identified, FA is already implementing it. So a good example of that will be the lands. I think there's a big booth outside. Randy was manning the booth before. Um, so the lands is a good example where we identified a service for authentication and authorization. And, and that has already been implemented as far as the land. So we are hoping that it's not a one-shot technology transfer, but it's basically gets implemented in phases, and we allow the operators operations to occur in a safe manner, rather than just big one push at the end. So we are doing tech transfer along the way. We have a UTM pilot project that is going to start happening pretty soon here and you will, uh, you will see a FAA adoption of the UTM concept and concept of operations document on the website. Perfect. Uh, Sean, I don't have a uh, pop culture quip for you, <laughs> although it would be easy. Um, He's the Sean Cassidy. Right, yes, I know. <laughs> so uh, just to get it, so everyone understands what you actually bring to the table, you used to be the vice president at ALPA, and you also uh, are on the DAC, or we're on the DAC work group to lead. So I worked with you on that. Uh, work, from work group two, that was uh, great. You did a great job there. My question for you, uh, can you explain the distinction between traditional air traffic control and emerging air traffic management functions uh, in the context of low altitude U.S. operations and how that four to 500 feet and under uh, is gonna affect uh, our folks here? Sure, so uh, first of all, thanks for the hospitality. This is kind of a homecoming because I've been to a lot of these events in the past. Um, when I was with the Pilots Association working on next-gen stuff, when I tried to explain the whole concept, the, the core, the essence of what next-gen was, it was driving up the efficiency and the capacity of the air traffic system through the use of technologies, policies, and procedures. And guess what? UTM is driving up the capacity and the efficiency of the airspace system, starting with low-altitude operations um, while using and employing technologies, policies, and procedures. And so if you look at this uh, pictorial right here, I could just kind of break that down a, down a little bit. We think about what we envision as a future delivery operation 
uh, we'll be operating in a portion of the NAS below 400 feet where you typically don't have uh, normal air traffic separation services. So we would be utilizing UTM to compare flight path trajectories, flight intent, and, and the like to make sure that we can provide some strategic separation. Once we get airborne and up to our transit altitude, we would be using technologies um, that would complement this information exchange that's kind of defined within the UTM concept. We're developing right now computer vision tools and all kinds of uh, independent sensors which would allow us to not only work with collaborative vehicles, things that are squawking and talking and the like, but also uh, chance encounters with those who are not talking and those who are not piped into some shared communication system. And um, as far as procedurally, uh, we would be talking about this kind of shared set of business rules defined by algorithms and, and, and other uh, you know, shared operating rules depending on the type of airspace and the type of operation. Um, we basically treat this as analogous to the way the ATC system works. So under air traffic control, when I was an airline pilot, we would obviously have a dispatch operation. I would get a flight plan, and, and uh, that basically provided strategic separation um, that would be managed uh, jointly between, you know, obviously the pilot and our air traffic controllers. TCAS, you know, TCAS uh, is, is an incredibly powerful tool for separation assurance in which one vehicle performs an interrogative of another one. And guess what? There is an analogy, there's an analogy to that under a UTM, a management system, where basically you take this handy-dandy device that I have in my pocket here called a cell phone, and use the ability for modems, flying modems, to communicate with each other and apply those same algorithmic uh, processes that allow for us to share position awareness of each other and separate. And then finally are those sensors that we talked about, the, you know, the developing the technologies that allow for independent uh, sense and avoid capabilities, regardless if, it, if, the, if the communication structure is up, regardless if the cell network is up. So what's the big difference between air traffic control and air traffic management? The air traffic control system is wonderful. It's incredibly safe, best in the world. I've, I've lived it for, for many, many years, and you have a lot to be proud of. The air traffic management system, however, under a UTM concept, um, accommodates scale by allowing those traffic management functions to reside within the industry with the appropriate interfaces with the authorities, but not necessarily creating so much clutter that it becomes a distraction and it becomes unmanageable to, to air traffic control. So it's basically kind of a new, new paradigm that uses new technologies, new communication techniques that's kind of indexed to those kind of growth rates that Steve was just talking about in the intro. Follow up, uh, Sean and PK, is, is it fair to say that, that the ultimate goal here with UTM and that low level area is that we you're developing a system that really is seamless and invisible to the current air traffic system. So the, the controllers in the audience, this is not something they necessarily be concerned about. It's going to function below them, and the air traffic system can interact with it if need be, but otherwise it's, it's completely operating seamlessly. Is that a fair statement? That, that's exactly right. I mean, I'm looking at all these banners around here, and, and uh, I, think, I think the uh, entering proposition is, and above all, we have to be safe. And the way that we're safe is to manage the operations in such a way that they don't create a distraction, but create the visibility for when the aviation, when the aviation authorities, when the local TRACON, when, when the controllers want to have visibility to that system. And always, if you have an off-nominal event, for instance, where you do have a vehicle that, that basically goes out of its planned flight trajectory, then you definitely create awareness of that so you can manage and make sure that it doesn't uh, encumber uh, the, the current air traffic operations that are underway. Okay. Dallas, uh, next question is for you. Um, and a little background on Dallas. He sent me his bio, and, and we only had an hour. So uh, <laughs> Dallas has been involved. I anything that's going on with UAS, <laughs> Dallas is right in the middle of it and a lot of times leading the effort. So uh, suffice it to say, he is, is, a, is an expert in this field. Um, in your operations down uh, at Mississippi State, you, are, you have COAs and are doing a lot of those interim altitude that I, I'll call them uh, flights, the, the above 400 feet but below the flight levels. Um, our, our system, we talk about safety and we talk about efficiency, and we gain those things and, and our system is safe and efficient largely because we have standards and procedures. And when you're operating in those interim altitudes, what, what are you doing, how are you coordinating with air traffic and with the airport environment 
uh, to develop and implement those standardized procedures. Well, and I'll start by pointing out the, the tremendous difference between operations in Part 107, which is what we've been talking about up till now, low altitude, smaller operations. Um, my flight research laboratory, which has been, it's a 70 year old institution, has been doing a lot of innovative aviation research for a very long time. Um, we solely operate under Part 91. So while there are Part 107 operations at Mississippi State, they're handled by somebody else. I fly big airplanes, and I do so for very long periods of time. Um, and so our program is structured very differently. Uh, just so you guys know, I'm a former Air Force controller. I come from a family of controllers. Dad was Marine Corps and FAA. My mom was Navy until she had the audacity to get pregnant. And then they, they back in those days, they made you get out. But um, uh, I actually had a chance to get together with some of my, uh, my mates from uh, Yokota Air Force Base that, uh, that are still working with the FAA now. But um, that background, that aviation culture, I got my private pilot's license in 1986. Um, is what we try to bring to the table on everything that we do at my laboratory. So when we approach an issue like coordination with air traffic controls from a, a very sound mindset, we take unmanned systems integration with a capital I, the integration piece. It's not we want you to accommodate us, we don't want you to bend over backwards, we don't want you to change any procedures. So first off, all my pilots have to, have to be FAA qualified in manned aircraft. That's my rule. Um, all of my maintainers are A&P mechanics. That's my rule. Um, all of our coordination procedures are, are done at a very, very detailed level. We, we've got pages and pages of, of coordination procedures at specific airports. Um, I've got a certification engineer that goes over the aircraft uh, for airworthiness, and that engineer is a 30-year Bell Textron vet that's been doing this for a very long time. So the message I'm trying to get across here is everything we try to do with unmanned systems, we try to do it the same way we do manned aircraft because we're flying big, heavy airplanes. We're flying anything from 185 pounds is our lightest one to our heaviest one's about 550 fully loaded, stays in the air for 12 hours, right? That's a, that's a substantial mass going at a, at a fairly decent speed, so it needs to be treated like an aircraft. So getting to the crux of your question, when we sit down with an air, air traffic facility, um, ordinarily we're looking at uh, about 80% of our operations are conducted off of Class C airfields. That always starts with a letter of agreement with the local airport manager. Uh, when it's Class D, we'll still do that letter of agreement, but we'll supplement that letter of agreement with a, a, a book of standard operating procedures, which then that air traffic control facility gets to go through with us and say, uh, at our airport, here's what we want you to do. In some cases, they want us to fly the traffic pattern opposite turns, right, to be on the other side of the runway. In some cases, they want us to, to basically fly a SID uh, that's custom made for UAS to get us out of the way when we're moving on to our our eventual destination where we're testing and training. Um, but we sit down and we have those conversations and sometimes it takes months, but that's okay, right? Because by the time we're finished, every controller at that facility knows exactly what we're gonna do, where our ground control station's gonna be, how we're gonna taxi, how we're gonna make our radio calls. Once we depart, what, what they can expect, if something goes wrong with the airplane, how it's gonna behave, where it's gonna go, how long it's gonna hold, and how it's gonna land. All of those things are worked out in advance and then we drill them. Um, because we're using military grade systems at my lab, we get the chance to, uh, to put in first, second, third level contingency management procedures right into the aircraft. They're extraordinarily predictable. Probably the best safety event of an unmanned aircraft is one that's properly programmed and properly maintained is excessively predictable. It's gonna do exactly what you told it to do. So in those cases, uh, we find that the, the trust that we build with controllers at our Class D facilities uh, gets pretty high pretty fast because they, they, it's always exactly the way we say it's going to be. And when they need us to deviate, they call it, and we've, we've got a, you know, a pilot managing that flight at all points, and we do exactly what they tell us to do. So in essence, it's another airplane in their pattern when we're in the pattern. And when we're not in the pattern, we're still making the calls to the appropriate radar approach control facility, the appropriate center, whom we also have letters of agreement with. There's a reason, you see this map behind you, we've got 6,000 square miles of COA airspace in Mississippi, and that's just been built out in the last two years. Um, the, the big chunk to the northwest there, that's 5,000 miles that stretches across the Mississippi River. We do a lot of massive survey work there for NOAA, for USGS, uh, other agencies, Department of Agriculture. We're flying big, long, heavy flights for, for a long period of time there. There's, uh, yeah, there, so that's the, the Delta COA. You'll see that all, all those red circles are operating airports. Right? Um, one, one, two of those are Class D. One of them that, that you see X'd out is the one that we don't even fly near because we felt the traffic density was going to be a little too uh, interruptive to operations in that area. Um, but you'll also see the orange dotted lines. Th those are the return routes to the various airports 
if we have an issue and we need to come back and land, or if we lose comms. Here's what's going to happen. All of this is predefined. And you're always going to go to the closest place, and you're going to do that in a way that avoids other traffic and in a way that avoids uh, other airports. So as you see, we spend, we spent years, literally, and in any given facility, we spend months working out what these details will look like, and we hand in glove with controllers the whole step of the way. And there's, we have had zero issues, absolutely zero. So taking that aviation mindset, that aviation culture, uh, bringing our approach, which is we're going to behave like any other airplane you work with, and if anything looks different, we'll fix it, uh, makes it a pretty smooth and seamless transition for Part 91 operations uh, to any air traffic control facility that we work with. OK, thanks, Dallas. Sandy, you're up. Great. Um, to bring a little perspective, you're a staff specialist at Syracuse, and you maintain currency uh, in the operation, right? But most of your duties, or a lot of your duties, have to do with dealing with the Air National Guard and uh, the rules and allowing them to, to fly. So uh, what are some of the main differences working uh, unmanned versus manned aircraft at Syracuse? Um, well, first I wanted to say thanks for having me. I feel very honored to be part of this panel. I'm almost not quite qualified to be on stage with people that have such grand experience. I've been at the Controller at Syracuse for nine years, but um, it's been an amazing experience. So surprisingly, working in MQ-9 is pretty much like working any other airplane. It's uh, pretty simple when it comes down to it. It's we talk to the pilot when he's on the ground, we give him a clearance. We give him a, a taxi clearance and we give him a takeoff clearance. Um, what becomes challenging is when we have to start using the rules that we have in place and rules that we don't quite have in place yet and uh, some regulations that the FAA has given us in order to allow them to operate safely in the NAS. One of those things is obviously there's not a pilot on board, so they need to abide by CFR 91.113, and they've determined that using a chase plane will be one of those ways in which we can safely operate the MQ-9 in and out of a class, Charlie. So we have a chase plane that departs every morning. It hangs out, waits for the MQ-9 to taxi out, and then he meets up and brings them out to a restricted area where the MQ-9 can climb up into Class A airspace. As you may or may not know, the MQ-9 is allowed to fly in Class A airspace without a chase plane. However, the chase plane that we utilize at Syracuse doesn't feel comfortable climbing all the way up to flight levels, so they can only climb up to about 10,000 feet. So in order to get the MQ-9 out to the flight levels they need to be, they need to travel about 35 miles northwest of Syracuse, so the chase plane follows them. Now the challenge comes in that the MQ-9 needs to be on an IFR flight plan, where the chase plane has to be on a VFR flight plan. So now we have an IFR aircraft that needs to maintain BMC conditions, which, as you know, in Syracuse, you know, it's super sunny there all the time. So um, sometimes that requires the MQ-9 to be at lower altitudes where they'd be more likely to encounter VFR non-squawking, non-talking aircraft. That also puts them in an area where they might come in contact with clouds. They have to stay below the clouds, so those are not depicted on a scope. So they are going to be requesting vectors around clouds that we can't see. So that becomes challenging for the controllers in the radar room. Now, they go out every day, um, Monday through Thursday usually. There's two or three of them that go out, transition out to the restricted area to get out to do their missions. Uh, once we get them out to the restricted area, they climb and they talk to Boston Center. Uh, the way in which we interact with Boston Center is going to be changing here shortly, but currently, right now, Syracuse uh, doesn't interact with Boston Center too much. Um, that would be strictly between the pilots and uh, Boston Center. So now when they come back, they exit the restricted area, and they want to come back in to land. Now this is where we also run into, we have an IFR aircraft that needs an approach clearance. There's not equipment on board an MQ-9 that has the ability to fly an ILS approach or an RNAV approach. Uh, they are also restricted from fly, uh, flying a visual approach. So we had to come up with some workarounds for that, and what we've done works. So now we've, we've transitioned 
he's gone out to restrict area, he's come back, and now we're transitioning to the tower. So now there's some challenges that are present in the tower environment as well. The MQ-9 can't follow anybody, and they are not allowed to maintain visual separation. So that requires the controllers to provide the wake turbulence separation for them as well. So they'll come in, they'll let us know whether they want to make a full stop, whether they're going to be stay in the pattern. And once they stay in the pattern, that's when we're integrating them in fully with the airlines. Uh, at this point, this is where the chase plane usually breaks off. They will come in and land, and the visual observer duties of the chase plane transitions to a ground observer who is parked in a truck on the south side of our airfield, which is on the Air National Guard base, and they now are uh, becoming the visual observer and letting the pilot know if there's anything amiss. So. Once they're in the pattern, they're like working any other VFR aircraft in the pattern. You can extend them upwind, you can extend them downwind, you can give them a short approach. They're very good pilots. They know their stuff, they're very accommodating, um, and it's, it works. The, we get questions by other pilots saying, what is that thing? You know, they wanna know what it is, they're curious. Um, when they do pattern work at night, the most common comment we get across the frequency is, hey, check your landing light, check your landing light. Because an MQ-9 doesn't have a landing light. They don't need one. Where the landing light would be is basically for their night vision. So, you know, we have the red light and the green light, but there's no landing light for them. So, you know, that's interesting to hear that come across the frequency as well. And then the last thing that I think probably was the most shocking or that the controllers had to get to used to the most was the taxi speed of the MQ-9. So on the taxiways, the MQ-9 can only taxi 10 knots, and on landing and on the runway, it can only go 25 knots, which, as all of you know, is super slow. So when you have Delta on a four-mile final already going 120 knots for you, it's a uh, Interesting when your aircraft that you're pretty sure is going to make the next taxiway is uh, going super slow. So, just so you're aware, four miles is enough. It's plenty of room. <laughs> but uh, that's where we had to basically uh, adjust on how we worked the aircraft. So, it's been interesting, it's been challenging, but honestly, for the most part, once those few hurdles were worked out, it's basically like working any other aircraft, and it's working. Thank you. So, Copper, um, so at Syracuse two years ago, you be, the, the Guard moved their operation there, becoming the first FAA-controlled civilian airport where we have integrated unmanned aircraft into, into uh, in with manned aircraft. Um, you have extensive experience uh, as a fighter pilot, manned fighter pilot, um, and now you've transitioned over to flying the MQ-9. From your perspective, what's the difference, or is there a lot of difference, in how you operate as an unmanned pilot versus a manned pilot? Um, I spent eight years of my career flying T-38s and F-16s, and then uh, went kicking and screaming to MQ-9s almost eight years now. Um, the difference is pretty stark. Um, Whereas I was surrounded by a canopy and could see in every direction, now I'm put in a metal box and I'm given a TV screen with a fixed uh, width of about 30 degrees. Uh, there is the movable sensor ball on the bottom of the aircraft, which can uh, go 360 degrees around, but it's also blocked by the fuselage, so looking up is restricted. Uh, it, the air crew complement is different. Um, there are two people in the aircraft, but one, the other one is not a pilot. It's a sensor operator, and his primary duty in combat is uh, controlling the, the sensor ball. But uh, in the terminal area, he does fulfill some co-pilot duties uh, and moves the ball around to help us find conflicts and traffic. Uh, I, I did bring a video uh, to help give you guys an idea of what it looks like from our perspective, uh, just to set that up. 
First of all, most people are surprised at how large the aircraft is. It's a 66 foot wingspan, uh, 11,000 pounds, and uh, we cruise around 120 indicated. And you know, in combat, we're, we're airborne for nearly 20 hours. Uh, in Syracuse, it's, it's more like 12. Uh, the terminal area is just a very small part of our mission, and we get above in the flight levels, and we do our training. Um, you're going to see uh, two cameras. Uh, we keep two camera, two different sources uh, on both the pilot station and the sensor operator station. Uh, they, we have two fixed cameras, an infrared and a TV, and then the sensor ball can be switched between uh, day TV and infrared as well. So you'll see both those cameras simultaneously. Before you ask, uh, yes, there is a boom on the front of the aircraft, and that is hair dangling from the boom. It is horsehair, and it's how we can tell uh, a slip indication. Um, I think that's enough to set up the video. Okay, can we play the video? Uh, roll film. All right, so here we're taking off. Uh, the chase aircraft is already airborne. They've called visual, and they're maneuvering to uh, fall into formation with us. You'll see on the right side, the ball is going to swing to the right, and uh, you'll also see them zoom in and put eyes on the chase ship. It's not, it's not necessary. Uh, our side screens have all sorts of situational uh, awareness tools. One of them is called Zeus, where we have every single um, air traffic control uh, hit just like a controller. There's just a little bit of latency there. Um, this is where we're, we've climbed in the restricted area. The ball is swung backwards as a precaution because we're in the clouds. Uh, it's not good when your camera ice is up. Uh, you can see the training missile. And we're talking to Boston Center getting cleared from the restricted area into one of the ATCAs. And then this is 10 hours later on the RTB. We've descended in the restricted area. Uh, pilot is, uh, he's listened to ATIS. He's contacting Syracuse Approach. Uh, we are using that uh, Zeus SA tool to see. Oh, can you pause the video now? Um, we use the Zeus tool to help coordinate the rejoin, and then uh, we return to base with the chase ship. And uh, the main thing I think I want to set up here is uh, the I, I've lost my peripheral vision as a, as a pilot. Uh, I did not realize how much I relied on that. I used to think the hardest landing in the Air Force was a T-38 single engine no flap with a student's head in the front seat in the way. But this is, this is a lot harder uh, just because you can't feel uh, the wind gusts and uh, you're looking through a soda straw. So uh, if you hit play, this is what our approach to landing looks like. That's the sensor operator calling out uh, heights from uh, our laser altimeter. And like Sandy was saying, uh, there's very often a airliner sitting there on the taxiway, and uh, they'll s <laughs> Syracuse Tower will say, hey, I can get you guys airborne before the, the MQ-9. And they're like, no, no, we need to do some more checks. We're going to sit here and wait. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they like to co comment on our landings. But uh, I do have to give a shout out to Sandy because uh, Inevitably, someone goes, that, that one of them unmanned drones, and damn it, I'm a man, and I, I'm flying it. And uh, <laughs> Tower almost always corrects them and say they prefer to be called remotely piloted, and that's an MQ-9 Reaper. So thanks for that. Okay. <laughs> thanks, Copper. Unfortunately, Dallas had to take off. He's, uh, his busy schedule, he had a flight to catch, so that's... The panel wasn't so boring for him that he got up and walked out. That was what was going on. <laughs> I thought maybe you needed a breath mint. <laughs> yeah. 
So PK, the next big thing being talked about in the world of UAS is urban air mobility, UAM. Can you give us a brief explanation of how UAM works and how you see it impacting the NAS? It's a great question. We don't have all the answers, but well, we'll it's start. a good question because yeah. you wrote it. But yes, it's <laughs> but uh, urban air mobility is supposed to basically increase the convenience of uh, com uh, commute in urban airspace, uh, so that you can reduce your traffic congestion on the road and uh, reduce your uh, unproductive time by flying through the urban airspace. So that's sort of the hypothesis and the promise. Uh, there are a number of things that need to happen to get there. Of course, uh, battery, distributed electric propulsion type aircraft, and uh, some aircraft have been postulated to be autonomous, so certification of those, and then airspace operations and how it will fit with the conventional air traffic management and without overloading the air traffic control system as we know. Uh, so if it's operating under one thought about that is if it's operating under uncontrolled airspace, then it, it could use the same principles we talked about in the UTM where it's interoperable through the data exchanges and staying away from each other through collaboration and share and care type of environment. The question becomes when it goes into the controlled airspace, how do we manage that? Uh, do we have a corridor? Do we have ways to keep them separate from the manned aircraft or the manned aircraft separate from them or both, um, particularly in case of contingencies. We have seen this um, uh, interesting effects when emergencies of nominal conditions and contingencies occur, like the bird strike example we saw in New York and a few others. Uh, how do we manage these contingencies without overloading the current system and air traffic controllers workload. So this still is a research uh, in our opinion. We are still working on it. Uh, we would like to take advantage of as much development that's happening in UTM, but at the same time, we recognize that these vehicles will go below 400 feet and interplay with the a small UAS, and they will operate, when they get closer to the airports, they will operate and interplay with the manned aviation as we know today. So there is going to be a interesting um, interoperability con uh, consideration, particularly in the, in the case of uh, off nominal conditions and contingencies, how best we can manage those. That's been still a matter of uh, studying and research. Thank you. All right, this next question, I'm, I just want to pose it to the whole panel. Um, Sandy earlier used the word workarounds, and I think most controllers uh, are familiar with the word workaround. It actually ought to be defined in the 7110, I think. We, uh, we all have workarounds that we do to, to accommodate systems, uh, requests. Um, in your particular areas of UAS, what workarounds have you had to implement to operate? Um, Sandy, you talked a little bit about it. So, Randy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick this to start with you. From, from the regulatory standpoint, I don't know that we're calling them workarounds, but um, what do you see as some accommodations or workarounds that we've had to do uh, at the FAA in order to enable flight? Um, literally hundreds. Um, I'll, I'll say from uh, the earlier years, uh, I'll call it 2008 timeframe, where uh, a lot of the authorizations were being granted uh, I mean, we finally reached and passed 1,000 at that point uh, for the year, and what we've seen was on every single one of them, coordination and understanding and input from the air traffic facility was absolutely vital. They know the airspace the best. They know the, all the procedures associated with the traffic flows associated with it. Us at headquarters process and the application did not have that information, so we had to go to them and ask for them. And what happened is because of some of the limitations that unmanned aircraft have, capabilities, uh, equipage, et cetera, we've been able to accommodate them to fly in their particular airspace and what they've uh, requested to do. So we found a lot of things that we had to do. So a lot of the regulatory requirements for communications, equipage, and all that stuff actually had to be either waived or uh, bypassed or put some kind of um, 
uh, a workaround, I'll use your word, uh, in place to do that. Some is uh, done through communications through a telephone, start and stop times. Um, so I would say from, uh, uh, from my perspective, in the last 10 years, we've seen a lot of those um, implementation of those workarounds actually start to disappear. And a lot of that's been uh, the facilities uh, awareness and understanding of the aircraft capabilities and uh, their inability to do certain things. And uh, it's actually been written into procedure and understanding and captured that way either through policy uh, or through uh, changing of regulations uh, here and there uh, to address some of their uh, limitations. Okay. Sean, is, is Amazon Prime Air is trying to get airborne and even in the testing you're doing, what what sort of accommodations, workarounds have you guys had to do? So uh, just to be clear, by workaround, we're not talking about something that gives us a pass on required minimum levels of safety. And so by, by workarounds, we're looking at trying to figure out a way to get through a process that was never referenced to unmanned systems in the first place. And, and it's something that Randy and me and Steve and Copper are all working on right now through rulemaking committees and advisory groups and everything else. And let me give you a good example of that. Right, right now, as we speak, we're meeting with FAA um, through aircraft cert, through flight standards, through the policy and innovation office, through, through ATO. And we're looking at all those different rule sets that a current air carrier operation would have to comply to um, in order to perform uh, some kind of an operation. And, and there are certain rule sets which clearly don't apply, supplemental oxygen, <laughs> Um, the requirement that a pilot under Part 61 license learn how to side slip to land and, and other things, and yet those are stat those are requirements which are kind of defined within the rule sets. So what we're doing right now is looking to establish the means by which we can economize in the process and demonstrate that we can meet the intent of those rules that do define the required safety levels without having to get caught up in the bureaucracy and, and some of the more granular kind of Byzantine stuff, which clearly don't apply. And, and that's kind of what we're doing right now also through the Access in a Controlled Airspace rulemaking committee that we're all involved with is, is looking at the current rule sets, looking at those instances where air traffic controllers, you're looking at your DOT 65 controller's manual, and there's clearly a lot of divergent places where a lot of the UAS do not conform or behave in ways that you would expect most uh, manned aircraft to, and devising policies and procedures which would create an accommodation for that, but, but again, while, made, while meeting minimum safety levels. Okay, so this is decades of FARs, essentially, that have been designed for manned flight, and we're, we're trying to fit a square peg into a round hole, in a way, and we're trying to make that work is really what, what we're talking about here overall, is that? Right, yeah, I mean, you, you, look at, you look at all the rules out there and they're written for a very good reason. I mean, because there's, there were, you know, all of those probably came as a consequence of some event that happened and, and for, to meet a required level of safety. I, I think that uh, as, as we move towards understanding and really getting back to the intent of the authors that, that are defined in the preambles to the rules and understanding what the real purpose of the rule is, that kind of helps us to um, work in partnership with FAA and, and others to create an alternate pathway, but that again maintains a safety level, but but is is different. I mean, 91.113, you know, right of way rules, and within that, there's you have the, the operator has to exercise vigilance for seeing a void. There's nothing that that implies electronic means of compliance to that, and yet, look at all these systems that are you know uh, uh, being developed right now. Hopefully, there'll be something in the future that allows for a means of compliance with a system that demonstrates um, the, the same kind of performance and responsibilities that, that I would have to uh, perform and, uh, as, as a pilot in command, you know, in, 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 a manned, in a manned flight deck. PK, from NASA's perspective, what are you seeing in this area? Uh, in the shortcuts? Workarounds, um, accommodations, whatever you want to call them, um, in order to be able to conduct research and, and things like that. Well, I think most of our uh, studies, uh, instead of calling work around, I'll say a lot of good lessons learned, uh, which has implications on how you let them fly. For example, when we were doing tests in Reno, Reno is uh, 5,080 feet, and when it was a hot day, 98 degrees, 
and there was headwind. Uh, some folks thought their vehicle and the battery is able to go past uh, beyond visual line of sight. But when you, you, the density altitude gets impacted with such conditions, and all of a sudden you see a very significant change in the level of performance. So I think part of the work around is to understand, given that you can't really operate vehicle uh, in those conditions, you really need to understand the environmental conditions, the altitude, the density altitude implications, the temperature and the impact on the battery life so that you can modulate that. The other thing that I will tell you, a very interesting example of it's, it's all about safety kind of situation where you have to expect the unexpected and the work, there is no workaround for expecting and maintaining the highest level of safety in that sense. When we were doing tests in one of the test sites, uh, even though we had said that we were going to do the test, please don't come there. You know, we had you know, sort of all those notifications. However, a Piper Cup uh, shows up on, there's no radio, no beacon. We couldn't connect with the uh, pilot right away. And we realized that we had to basically land all the aircraft or the unmanned aircraft systems right away. And the UTM sent messages, and we had uh, ground radars that were also checking out. And we landed and maintained the safety of operations. The fundamental thing over there is when it comes to, down to the safety, there is really no shortcut. You really had to be ex very well prepared to accept these kind of unexpected situations and maintain the safety, particularly as you go beyond visual line of sight, you have no choice because you can't see the aircraft, you can't see the other drones, so you really need to have a very foolproof system that allows us to do that. Now, what were one or two big workarounds that you guys had to come up with at Syracuse? Well, the, the chase ship is the, the biggest workaround for see and avoid. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. I think something that uh, controllers may not realize, though, is uh, unlike any other large normal aircraft, we can only land in one place. And so that drastically changes our risk assessment uh, and our decision making, especially in the case of weather. So uh, I, I have to be more conservative because Syracuse is the only place I can land that doesn't hurt me too bad when I'm flying in local airspace, but we've started supporting more exercises and, and we're starting to be asked to do domestic operations. We flew from Florida to New York, it's a thousand miles, and uh, we had to be careful because I could only turn around and land back at Florida or to Syracuse. Um, and. I guess another workaround, uh, it works at Syracuse because we have a good relationship with the Boston Center and Cleveland Center with the ATCAs, but we're starting to see that we are really creating uh, controller workload issues when we're doing some of these uh, more ad hoc missions. Uh, everyone in the national airspace above 180 is trying to get somewhere, point A to point B, as fast as possible and efficiently. We want to get someplace we're slow when we get there, and then we'd like to stay there for 10, 12 hours and fly in random directions, and that really, really messes up controllers, and there's not a simple way to put that on a flight plan or set that, uh, that airspace up. All right, thanks. Sandy, from a controller's perspective, what were? Uh, like I mentioned before, one of the biggest workarounds is getting them to the airport. You know, how are we transitioning them from their IFR flight plan to a VFR flight plan? And so we were able to come up with verbiage in our LOA that we worked out with um, the Air National Guard that works for us so that we can get them back to the airport safely. All right. So we talked about workarounds. What do you guys think are the biggest barriers to integration? Right, how are we going to get the integration and move forward? Randy. Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, so the easy question. No, I, I think we've been working towards integration for uh, 10, 20 years uh, for UAS. Um, so, and I think it's really become more highlighted, um, one, by the, the overwhelming numbers that we're seeing. Um, our first congressional language showed up in 2012, uh, and uh, that really kick-started a lot uh, from that perspective. Uh, but uh, integration to me means basically I don't have to write any waivers. 
I don't have to write any authorizations. They fly under a set of rules, just like all the other airframes do. And then occasionally, if they need something special, then they can come back to the FAA and ask for a waiver from existing rule set. So integration to me basically means the maturation of rules and, uh, and our current policies that we have. Um, just so, you know, if you, a uh, short history lesson, um, our current uh, order that we have, the 7200.23, that took eight years to get to fruition, uh, to come to where it should actually be an order. We worked on notices that changed every six to 12 months uh, for seven years because the industry and policies and things changed so rapidly uh, we were unable to keep up with it. Um, so integration to me means uh, they're operating just like any other airframe uh, out there. And, uh, um, and I'll just call them, I'll call it seamless if, uh, if that's an appropriate word. I think one of the biggest workarounds towards integration really was the development of the USAFMs and the utilization of lands. I mean, that saved your office tons of man hours. Yeah, I agree. I think Lance uh, is a, uh, a great capability uh, that was put in place, um, taking the human out of, uh, uh, of a manual processing and authorization business and, and creating the parameters and uh, doing it electronically. Uh, and uh, as we said, most and, and safely to, uh, to uh, get the input and initial parameters, which we think the uh, aircraft can operate in controlled airspace with uh, out direct intervention or uh, uh, communications with them uh, and put it in a format and uh, deliver it to the public and uh, that, that reception has been uh, fantastic. Uh, almost uh, 50,000 approvals uh, coming up through uh, utilizing Lance to access uh, controlled airspace. I think the reception has been quite well from the public. Sean, other than FA bureaucracy, what, uh, where are we at moving toward? What's a, another barrier towards integration? Can I like call my lifeline and ask? Yeah, sure. You get a lifeline. Well, for, first of all, let me let me say something <laughs> positive uh, to kind of kick the comments off. FA has been great to work with, and I'm not just saying that to make Randy feel nice, but we, we do a lot of very uh, kind of out of the box um, work and working groups, and and uh, even something I need to continue to remind my team that the FA is not this monolithic agency that that just has this kind of one unanimity of views. There's a lot of very forward leaning people, and there's also you know there's also bureaucrats as well. So, you know, the previous administrator had this lovely term, it was called regulation at the speed of innovation. And, and then the, the ne next interim administ acting administrator had, uh, it says FAA is open for business in, in the context of these programs that are getting started up. Um, I, I think that th that's all positive that they're kind of setting that kind of mindset for that, but the challenge we have right now, let me give you a really good example under the regulation at the pace of innovation. We're developing these amazing perception systems, things that can detect, um, perceive objects, disambiguate them, and, 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 you know, and, and kind of identify whether or not they are something that should be avoided or something that's maybe a, you know, a false target, um, which can then be uh, correlated to flight behavior and, and the like. Um, the regulatory challenge that we have right now is there's nothing out there um, in, in terms of com the compliance piece, which defines how we validate those systems, how we validate the tools that we use to validate those systems so that we can incorporate them. Um, it was just a conversation I was having with, Ant with uh, Randy just before the, the panel about things that we can do under experimental basis, you know, finding a safe haven to, to you know, uh, evaluate these things. And, it, and it's always going to be a challenge just because of the the agility and the speed at the, and the, the focus on relentless innovation uh, in, in the industry. So I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges right now beyond the other kind of operational rule sets is just defining, you know, how we, how we certify these, these autonomous systems and, and how we get approval authority to start using them. There, because there's a lot of benefits that go well beyond just the unmanned uh, aircraft sector. I think a lot of those will be directly applicable to general aviation, light sport aircraft, and the like in terms of safety systems and technologies that can be incorporated into them as well. PK, do we get to full integration without onboard detect and avoid? I do think we need onboard detect and avoid, particularly if you want to maintain the highest level of scalability. Uh, if you look at the smalls, then you can get away with um, a lot of strategic planning and strategic deconfliction with trajectories separated. 
but, uh, and that's similar to oceanic, right? You have buffers that are different than what you see in en route and, and such. But having better surveillance and ability to track your vehicle and then detect the other vehicle and its presence allows you to get much closer to each other and increase the scalability. I do think that's very important to be able to do that. Uh, to Jeff's original point, I think you're absolutely right. UTM is a one type of workaround. It's an electronic means of doing things without burdening the system. And I was happy that Randy didn't say the biggest barrier is NASA's research. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> the integration. So oh, no. it's, six years ago, we were too fast for FA and too slow for industry. And now we have found, all of us have found the right rhythm and equilibrium in, in the pace at which we are going. Uh, there are lots of interesting things uncovered that uh, we didn't realize would happen, but I think we are on the same pace. Uh, we, we all obviously feel that we can all go faster, but I think we are doing it the right way through tight collaboration. Okay. I'm gonna take a question from the audience here. Um, Randy, this is for you. Why doesn't the FAA mandate the operators of UAS get some sort of formal training, especially if they're operating near an airport? Uh, so they do. Uh, under uh, Part 107, there is a knowledge test associated with that and a remote pilot's license that's issued uh, from that. I, I will say it is a, uh, so one, I'm not a Part 107 operator, so I don't know what's on the test, uh, but our uh, flight standards organization uh, that uh, creates the test ensured that there were airspace knowledge uh, questions in there. And uh, again, to what level of detail, I'm not aware, but uh, it was done that. And also to understand the structure of how the airspace is set up, including, uh, including the um, uh, routes, VR routes, IR routes, uh, Victor, all of them are um, in that particular knowledge test. I really think that question was probably more directed towards hobbyists operating near an airport, which don't require the training. Yeah, I'm sorry, Jeff, I couldn't hear you. Oh. I said, <laughs> um, I think the question was probably directed more towards the hobbyists uh, and their ability to operate near an airport simply with notification. Yeah, the hobbyists or recreational users are, are probably uh, one of the biggest education challenges that we have out there existing, we only have uh, an advisory circular that's been uh, put out there, advisory circular 91-57 alpha change one. Uh, and it basically gives them basic guidance uh, and uh, information uh, to operate under. Um, and part of that is to not operate near uh, an airport environment. And if you do, you should reach out to them and, uh, and coordinate uh, the use of your uh, uh, UAS uh, close to that area. But what we're seeing in a lot of the uh, sightings reports that we get uh, daily uh, and get reported back to us at headquarters is that they, they are operating in and around the airport environment. But you'd be surprised uh, where a lot of these sightings come back. They come out anywhere. Um, you know, by, uh, by one that I always remember is a sighting at flight level 355 and uh, always found it uh, the great level of detail in which that sighting was given uh, with that piece they described the U.S. to the T. And you know exactly what kind and what uh, manufacturer that UAS was. And it's amazing that, uh, uh, that uh, those little small airframes can actually get to that altitude, but uh, nonetheless, they're, they're out there and they are operating today. Okay. I wanna ask one more question out of the audience before we, we go to close. Um, I'm going to abbreviate the top question there, but are there plans to make ADSB equipment required on drones so that pilot could see them on TCAS? So there's a lot of discussion concerning ADSB usage um, and how it can benefit, um, and it's kind of broken up in a couple areas. So the larger airframes that will receive traditional air traffic services, file an IFR flight plan. Uh, we see that a capability and an installation on those type aircraft. Uh, but for the smaller ones, we're talking anything from you know, three pounds to uh, you know, a couple hundred pounds, maybe up to 500 pounds. The, the vast numbers uh, that are out there, uh, if, 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 that, if that mandate actually ran to them to do that, what you'd see is an overload in our infrastructure. Uh, the uh, overwhelming um, ability to handle uh, the additional aircraft 
uh, that would be using that system uh, would, uh, would, would affect it. And uh, currently right now that mandate is not running to the small uh, UAS for that. And we're looking at other alternatives. I mentioned remote ID earlier. Uh, so that's another alternative that's being uh, looked at and capability and how that will all uh, work into uh, a UTM environment uh, or a UAM environment um, uh, from that part. Okay, is it even possible to, to you know, 1.2 million now, 7 million in two years, is it even possible if that mandate was, was, uh, was actually implemented on small US, is it even possible to have the ADSB system accommodate that? Well, anything's possible with money, but um, I, it's, it's not really realistic okay. uh, to, to go down that path to do that. And nor do I think the operators, um, the overwhelming majority of what we'll see, uh, want to work in an identified environment and, uh, and, and be, be creative and, uh, and, and conduct commerce uh, from that point. You know, look, look, I've flown out of plenty of airports in dense, dense operating areas. I remember like every time I took off from Burbank, uh, I would take a right turn and I would get an automatic traffic advisory from all the traffic coming out of LA and the, departing. I think that's the last thing that, that pilots or controllers will want, want to see would just be this sea of, uh, you know, sea of uh, potential conflicts. And I think that's kind of, you know, just a very practical reason you probably wouldn't want that. But the other thing is there's already airport, there's already operating areas in dense class B where they're already uh, reaching saturation points with, with the current, you know, with the current ADS uh, requirements. And so it's for that reason, especially with low altitude operations that we're looking at for an alternate to ADS that would provide that electronic conspicuity through remote ID and tracking and would still provide interfaces to ATC as well um, because we would deem the air traffic control authority to be one of those modules that would plug into UTM that would have near real-time awareness of the operations that were happening. So it's still meeting, the, it's still meeting the, the intent of the safety of the operation but just doing it through a different technical means. Okay. We've got about five minutes left, so we've got one more question. First, I'm going to start with you, Sean. I love Amazon Prime. I can't wait for Amazon Prime Air. When am I going to be able to get my packages delivered via Amazon Prime Air? Boy, if I knew that answer, I'd have a condo in Aspen right now with a jet in the driveway. Um, <laughs> Pack well, you know, if you we, don't we, know, we, Sean, yeah, we, then we, uh, we, we, are very, we are very careful not to um, make any specific timeline projections. Um, I, I will say that there's a lot of, there's a lot of great things that are, that are happening um, with, uh, we're, we're currently in, you know, uh, doing a lot of test operations right now, uh, a, lot, a lot of flying both here and overseas. Um, just got announced that there's a program overseas that's kind of applying the European version of U-Space um, that'll take place in 2019. And so I, I think it's uh, just looking for that perfect kind of point where you get the, the regulatory kind of package lined up with our own internal VARs um, for the safety requirements because we will not deliver our first package until we're absolutely convinced that we can do so safely. Otherwise, we don't do it. All right, 30 seconds from each of you, predictions. Where are we going to be with UAS integration in five years, Sean? I think that we're going to have a lot more kind of normalized, kind of more routine uh, integrated operations. I still think that they'll be uh, a little bit smaller scale than, than a lot of people uh, in, envision in terms of the overall density of the operations, especially in your urban areas. Okay, Randy. Yeah, that's a good point, what Sean makes. I, I, I foresee it that way uh, with that piece, but I will go behind the scenes level a little bit. Uh, so you'll see less paperwork come into your facilities, less coordination needed for these uh, activities to uh, uh, take place, and uh, more mature policy and guidance out there uh, to help you provide a service to them. PK. Yeah, I think we will see the UTM research being uh, implemented in some fashion, the products of the research uh, through FIA's uh, UPP, UTM pilot project, and uh, we're hoping that uh, the operations will be supported uh, somewhere uh, by the UTM con construct and the environment will allow you to operate and uh, interoperate with the ATM. Okay. Copper, what, where do you see us? Well, we're just finishing up uh, installing a ground-based sense and avoid system at Syracuse. Should be operational soon. There's going to be four more uh, for guard sites: Tucson, uh, Fargo, North Dakota, Houston, 
and March Air Force Base, California. That's going to allow us to access pretty much the entire United States for domestic operations, and we're looking at integrating the General Atomics Airborne Sense and Avoid. And I encourage everybody to go look at the Sky Guardian display, and then go talk to your congressman to tell the Air Force to buy some, please. I need a new toy. <laughs> <laughs> Stan, the legal? last word is yours. I think that what we're doing at Syracuse is going to be just done across the NAS as normal operations. I think that what we're doing at Syracuse is um, just be going to become normal operations throughout the NAS, and it's going to be exciting. So going forward, I would say if your facility is requested to you know, fly and integrate with these MQ-9s, communication is number one. Educate your controllers um, and communicate with the user, the proponent, that has been key, and that's what's kept us operating so smoothly and so safely. And I'm really hoping for Paul's sake we get Purell and beer deliveries within five years. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that uh, concludes our panel. I want to thank each one of you for your willingness to participate and for sharing your expertise with us.